So I picked the topic, the future of cryptocurrencies, because that was generic enough that I could pretty much stick anything I wanted under that topic. <laughs> but don't worry, I got some good stuff. Um, I'm Andreas Antonopoulos. I'm a Bitcoin developer, commentator, and I guess an evangelist. And I just love Bitcoin. I'm just uh, really enjoying being in this space. Uh, I feel like I'm doing some of the most important uh, work in my life right now. And it's great to be among this community. So the topic I wanted to talk about today is the future of cryptocurrencies. And we're at the moment at the birth time of this incredible phenomenon that affects so many things in the world around us. And we don't really know where this is going. None of us knows where this is going. In fact, it's rather amusing to be having discussions with economists who claim to know exactly where this is going, even though they've never seen a cryptocurrency before, because we've never had a cryptocurrency before. That say things with absolute certainty like Bitcoin's going to zero, even though no currency in the history of mankind has ever gone to zero. You can still buy Roman Cisterci. And it has tourist value. <laughs> Which brings up an interesting concept, what is value? And how does value change in an environment where currency is abundant? So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about scarcity, abundance, and the source of value. I used to think that alt currencies were going to happen in their dozens. And then they started happening in their hundreds. And I used to think that alt currencies somehow threatened Bitcoin a bit, because part of Bitcoin's magic is the ability to create digital scarcity, to create something digital that is rare. And how can it be rare if you can have lots of them? And that kind of confused me, and I wanted to think about that a bit. And I gradually realized that um, scarcity is what gives the individual currency rarity, but it doesn't have to apply across the entire field of currencies. And so then I started thinking about what is monetary value and how it's derived. Because at some point I realized we're not going to have hundreds of altcoins. We're not going to have thousands of altcoins. We're going to have tens of thousands of altcoins and then hundreds of thousands of altcoins, and eventually millions of altcoins. At some point, I came across a website where you can uh, choose a name for a new currency. Uh, using a drop-down, you can select the proof-of-work algorithm you want. Uh, you can set monetary policy and be Ben Bernanke for a day. <laughs> and then you can press submit and launch a new cryptocurrency. And it costs a tenth of a bitcoin to do that. But if it costs a tenth of a bitcoin today, there's going to be a site that does this for free by the end of the year. <laughs> and then suddenly I realized that what this means is that before the end of 2014, a five-year-old in a primary school will launch Joey Coin to compete against Maria Coin, <laughs> launched by his friend, Frenemy. Friend. <laughs> Things change very fast in primary school. <laughs> but here's the thing. If you put young hominids together in a social environment, they invent currencies. They do this all the time, even before cryptocurrencies. If you see a primary school, they trade rubber bands, they trade lollipops, they create currencies of value within this small, isolated society. When the uh, Livestrong uh, rubber bands came out and people started promoting various charities with these rubber bands, they became tradable commodities in primary schools. And primary schools have been doing this for years. Tamagotchi, Pokemon cards, baseball cards, uh, even before that, marbles, and in my father's time, chestnuts. So they could play knockers, which is a weird game that involves banging chestnuts against each other. But here's the point. Currencies emerge when you have the social structure for currencies to emerge. And the reason that currencies are emerge in that manner is because currencies are a form of communication. Currency is a language. It is a language that allows people to exchange information about value. Not always monetary value. 
It is about value of friendship. It is about value of popularity. It is about value of celebrity. It is about value of brand. And all of these things have value, not necessarily monetary value. And currencies are the language by which this value is expressed. So within the primary school environment, currencies emerge even when they didn't have the ability to create currencies. Uh, my friend Davi Barker and I were discussing this topic yesterday, and he uh, told me a bit about Emperor Norton, uh, who was this man in California who made a fortune selling pickaxes to gold miners and mining equipment, because that's how you make the most money, is not by mining, but by selling the mining equipment. And <laughs> yeah. And then he did a bad deal which involved buying rice and uh, um, he lost all his money. And had a dream where he was visited by his mother and told that he had royal blood and he was in fact an emperor and should become the emperor of the Americas because America needed an emperor. So he used his last dollar to buy a civil uh, Civil War uniform and a big hat and a big ribbon, and went out in San Francisco and proclaimed himself to be the emperor. And he proclaimed the end of the Civil War, fired Lincoln and fired Congress, and he kept proclaiming things. And people started paying attention, and they thought he was ridiculous. And he created his own currency, and people thought he was ridiculous. And then one of the big San Francisco newspapers published his things to see and to tell everyone how ridiculous they were. And because the newspaper published it, suddenly it wasn't so ridiculous anymore. And this currency started being accepted in stores in San Francisco, and people were able to trade the coins of Emperor Norton. And a currency emerged spontaneously, as it does, because currency is a cultural artifact. It's a system of language. And the best affirmation of that currency was that people started counterfeiting Emperor Norton money. <laughs> you know something has value when people start copying it. So what did Emperor Norton lack? He had the meme, he had the popularity, he had the idea, he had the pizzazz, he had the fame. He lacked the protection against counterfeiting. He lacked the portability, he lacked the transportability, and he lacked the global reach. The next Emperor Norton, who might be five years old, will have all of those things. Because now, combined with a cultural artifact of money, we have the mechanics, the technology of unforgeable, instant, secure, cheap, fast asset transfer over an information network. And so, if you combine these thoughts together, what we realize is that money happens when people have a need to express value, and that means money will happen at an accelerated pace. So that's why I say we will have millions of altcoins. We will have Konya West, and this time Kanye will do it. <laughs> we will have Bill O'Reilly coin for ditto heads. We will have fame coins, and TV show coins, and primary school coins. We will also have coins made by governments, and coins made by banks, and coins made to solve specific problems, and coins that are memory hard, and coins that have different script functions. We are going to have coins across the entire spectrum. And at that point, we will have to start making some very difficult decisions. Because at that point, we have lost any way of knowing what has value. All of those coins will have value to their creators. The question is, how many of those coins will have monetary value for the rest of us? And when I thought about that, I realized that we have already done this once before. You see, before the growth of the internet, opinion and the authority of opinion depended entirely on the authority of the issuer of opinion, the gatekeepers of information. If you are the New York Times, you own a printing press that is four football fields long and three stories high, and you buy ink by the barrel. The ownership of that printing press 
becomes a proxy for authority of opinion, because not many people can do that. That is scarcity. Scarcity becomes a metric by which we apply authority of opinion. So the New York Times, by sheer ownership of that printing press, had authority of opinion. And then suddenly, anyone could have a printing press. Anyone could have a desktop-based printing press. And just at the same time that an Egyptian blogger on the front lines of the Egyptian Revolution suddenly had an opinion that was relevant, that was timely, and that was authoritative, at the very same time, New York Times was publishing bullshit by Judith Miller to drive us into a war. And so our world was flipped upside down because the sources of authority were crumbling before our eyes. And at the same time, millions of other opinions were coming out, which had no apparent, no intrinsic source of authority. And we had to recalibrate our world to understand authority of opinion as a matter of content, not source. Opinion was now not about who issued it, not about who distributed, and not about how big their printing press was but about how close to the information they were, how relevant that information was, and how many people were able to use that information to gain knowledge. In the new world of cryptocurrencies, governments and sovereigns no longer have authority that is created by the ownership of the printing press of the Fed. Authority now is derived by the use of the currency. Us using Bitcoin is what gives it intrinsic value, if you want to use that old term. Of course, nothing has intrinsic value. Certainly no money has intrinsic value. But if there is monetary value in a currency, it is derived from the use of that currency as a means of exchange, as a store of value by the users. Not by the sovereignty of the printing press that created it. So we now live in a new world where we will have millions of coins, and some of them will be Joey Coin and Maria Coin and Kanye West Coin, and some of them will be really important coins in the world financial environment. And here's the funny thing: we'll have no idea when one turns into the other. Because the line between a coin that's a fad and a coin that has monetary value is simply an adoption threshold. It's an issue of critical mass. At some point, the network effect, the viral adoption patterns of a currency, become big enough within a locality that that currency acquires monetary value. And it acquires monetary value because increasingly the majority of the people you interact with speak the language of that currency by exchanging it for other things of value. And we will have no idea how to distinguish between the two. Imagine a world where a decade from now, a Central African Republic has de facto adopted, through use of more than 50% of its GDP, as its national currency, Dogecoin. And not a single person in that country has any idea what that silly dog is doing on their coin. <laughs> but guess what? Most of those African countries had no idea what that silly white old lady was doing on their money. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth. And there is absolutely no difference between the two. The imp <laughs> In terms of monetary value, <laughs> the important thing for the user of that currency is, can I take this token of abstract value and get a dozen eggs with it? We have seen this happen before. M-Pesa started as a means for families to exchange cell phone minutes. And one day someone went to a store and said, I don't have any money. But I have two minutes left on my cell phone. If I give you a minute, can you give me three eggs? And a currency was born. And 11 years later, M-Pesa represents 40% of the GDP of Kenya, and it was never designed to be a currency. Currencies are not created from sovereignty. 
currencies emerge as a cultural art artifact, as a means of conversation, as a language with which we express value to each other. And I'll take it one step further. Now that we have cryptocurrencies, it's not sovereignty that creates currency. It is currency that will create sovereignty. By adopting Bitcoin on the internet, we are for the first time creating the internet sovereign currency. The purchasing power of Bitcoin at internet scale creates sovereignty for the internet. It creates an international, transnational, financial mega power. And we're building that right now. And we don't know if it's going to be Bitcoin or Dogecoin or any of the other coins, but it doesn't really matter. Because monetary value is not created at issuance anymore. It's created over time through adoption. So that's the story I wanted to tell you today about how value it derives coin, which derives sovereignty. And uh, that's all I had to say on the topic. I'd love to take some questions. Thank you. All right. Who's, uh, if you want to line up somewhere here, we'll put a microphone in front of you so you can uh, ask some questions. Anybody? Nobody. There you go. Pass it to the next person when you're done. Thanks. Hi, Andres. My name is Adam, and you mentioned once that Bitcoin has the potential to have M1, 2, 3, and 4 uh, potential. How it has what? M1, M2, M3, M4. Potential. Right. How is that possible? Uh, so uh, M0 is the nar narrow, uh, so the narrow uh, uh, money supply measure. Uh, so the narrowest supply of money measure is the actual physical coins in circulation. Right? That's how we measure, say for example, the uh, US dollars M0 is the uh, the stuff that's written on actual pieces of paper floating around the economy. That's the narrowest measure of money. And for Bitcoin, that's the, at the moment, uh, 11, 12 million uh, Bitcoins currently issued times their exchange rate or purchasing power. That's the M0 measure of Bitcoin. But um, exchanges can operate as a fractional reserve system, as can Bitcoin banks, and perhaps some of them already are. Uh, Bitcoin was implemented on Mt. Gox, as a zero percent fractional reserve system, <laughs> um, and so we will see this happen again. But it may happen deliberately. I mean, people may actually give out loans uh, with Bitcoin and create fractional reserve Bitcoin, where the original holders do not have immediately liquid Bitcoin to redeem against that. That immediately creates M1. Uh, and broader monetary supplies on top of that. Instruments, futures, derivatives, bonds, uh, debt obligations can be built on top of that to create a higher supply of uh, money out there. Essentially, the broader the monetary supply you're looking at, the lower the liquidity of that monetary supply. Hey, Andres. Hey. Um, Christoph, Atlas. A uh, question that I have is about Bitcoin derivatives. So, uh, coming out of the legacy banking system, it seems like a lot of the hijinks and the nasty stuff that we have in the financial sector comes from these highly derivative assets. And uh, something on the horizon for Bitcoin is a lot of people looking to create Bitcoin-based derivatives. And I know that a number of people have fears about this. That somehow that the uh, the stuff that goes wrong with U.S. dollar and other uh, fiat currency based derivatives are going to come to haunt US or the Bitcoin or that somehow these derivatives will allow governments to uh, manipulate the price of Bitcoin and metal in it. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that topic? Yeah. Um, I'm not worried about derivatives uh, because you know, there, there are derivatives and there are derivatives. A lot of what we see seems to be the result of um, out of control derivatives, but it isn't. It's a it's a combination 
of the result of out of control derivatives built on unsound money that has infinite inflation potential through a central bank that can do whatever the hell they want, whenever the hell they want, without seeking the consent of the governed. Um, keep in mind that derivatives are actually thousands of years old. Uh, the first derivatives were created in Venice in the, in the 15th and 16th century in order to sell uh, essentially futures on tax receipts uh, by Venetian families and in order to fund well, war, <laughs> as always. Uh, and so derivatives themselves are not bad. In fact, some sorts of derivatives can provide very beneficial results for the economy. For example, uh, at the moment, there is no uh, ability to uh, short Bitcoin. Uh, you cannot take a position against Bitcoin and benefit from it by borrowing Bitcoin, selling it, and then buying it back at a later date at a lower price. The problem with that is that when you have a, a currency that essentially has no ceiling, um, when good news happens, uh, it creates a, a really strong effect, a spike essentially of price that uh, goes way above the sustainable price. So, it, like it overcorrects up, and then it bursts, the confidence is somewhat shaken, and then you overcorrect down. Um, and you get into this oscillating pattern with very wide swings. A lot of that is because um, you don't have counter pressure. You know? uh, so for example, if I stick a needle in my tricep and anesthetize it, and then I try to pick up a glass of water, I'm going to knock myself out, because my bicep isn't designed to work without a counter muscle holding it back on the other side. Right? Um, the same thing in financial markets. If you only have up pressure and there's nothing constraining with down pressure, it creates very wild swings. Uh, so shorts would be very beneficial. The point is that if you build derivatives on a sound currency that cannot be inflated, the derivatives themselves are derived from soundness. Uh, and of course, if you take it too far, you can get further and further and further away from the fundamental store of value. But what's happened in our economy is that we've not only got further and further away from the fundamental store of value, but then we hollowed out the fundamental store of value. So there's actually nothing below it. So you build a pyramid of huge derivatives and then you take out the base uh, and the whole thing collapses. Well actually no, you just feed a uh, trillion dollars of quantitative easing at the bottom and then pray for five years. <laughs> and then the whole thing collapses, but that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm not worried about derivatives. I think under certain circumstances, derivatives can be very healthy uh, mechanisms to create uh, more predictable market behavior by allowing people to express uh, uh, many different risk scenarios in their purchasing uh, patterns. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Andres, thank you very much. Um, you're clearly one of the biggest voices in the uh, Bitcoin community uh, from a technical perspective and from advocacy Thank perspective. Um, I would, um, at the risk of uh, disagreeing with you um, in some Please. respect about uh, the all currencies, mm -hmm. I agree that there is a space for all currencies and um, while two, three or five or ten were okay, the fact that where we are going towards, you know, where you 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 now in a very loud voice, um, and the reason I say loud, it's the most effective technical voice that exists in the development community. When you say there's got to be thousands of uh, alt currencies, what is that doing to Bitcoin itself? Okay, uh, and I've listened to your uh, interview with Adam back as well. And uh, you know, we have a different uh, approach with Adam. Right. So let me just answer your question directly. I, th I think I understand where you're going with this. So let's talk about the distribution of these currencies. Like I think it's important to understand how these currencies get distributed. What we see in environments that exhibit network effect, and they exhibit open networks where you can have inclusion and expression at very high rates, is instead of seeing a normal distribution, which is a typical bell curve, uh, what you end up is what's called a power law distribution. And a power law distribution is the same thing you see in terms of artists and their sales on iTunes, or products and sales on Amazon.com. A power law looks like a very big peak at the top, and then it drops down dramatically, and then you have a long tail. Uh, if, you've, uh, if you haven't read the book The Long Tail, uh, I think it was by Chris Anderson, uh, definitely worth reading because he talks about power laws and network effects, and it applies to currencies even though this was before cryptocurrencies. 
what I expect to see is that gradually Bitcoin will end up with um, you know, 50, 60 percent of the market share. I'm just guessing numbers here, just to illustrate the purpose. Uh, 50 or 60 percent of the market share dominating the top of the power law, um, and then maybe three, four, five useful altcoins that have niche applications, primarily with features that Bitcoin cannot co-opt, cherry pick, or include in its roadmap. Perhaps because they're completely antithetical, like inflationary instead of deflationary, uh, because they're fundamentally um, discordant, like a different uh, uh, proof of work algorithm or proof of stake algorithm, etc. Those will come to fill in the environmental niche below with five or six coins, and then you have this very, very long tail that keeps getting longer and longer and longer with tinier and tinier and tinier market uses until you have coins that are used by 20 people in a club uh, in order to play than a weekly poker game, because it is an easier way to manage the accounting. Why not? And most of these will be irrelevant to the, to the, to the people at large. So here is what this does to Bitcoin. Every new um, currency that comes out competes for attention with Bitcoin, but it also validates the primary idea of cryptocurrencies, and thus it feeds directly into Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the oldest, Bitcoin is the most stable, Bitcoin is the most used, Bitcoin is the most trusted, Bitcoin is the most distributed currency, and it is achieving a network effect unlike we have ever seen before. You have the network effect of 100,000 nodes, you have the network effect of millions of dollars of ASICs that have been embedded into this ecosystem, you have the network effect of 50,000 merchants and growing, you have the network effect of 2.5 million users, all of these things feeding into each other. And based on money, real economic investment, and now startups and jobs and employees in these startups and developers who are learning the skills, and increasingly Bitcoin protocol being embedded in chips, chips that can't be modified very easily. Bitcoin's network effect is absolutely incredible. In fact, the the real issue is not whether an alt currency will displace Bitcoin. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. In fact, I think the bigger problem we're going to have is that we're going to find it harder and harder to upgrade Bitcoin. Just like IPv4 became so dominant, we've spent 16 years trying to upgrade it to IPv6, and so far with not much success. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just replacing it with its upgrade. Right? And we may see the same thing with Bitcoin. Uh, it will become increasingly difficult to achieve consensus for hard fork upgrades. So, um, I don't see any of this affecting Bitcoin other than increasing its, its power, increasing the dominance of cryptocurrencies. Keep in mind that any cryptocurrency that comes along has to prove stability and has to show that stability of a period of time. And in the meantime, Bitcoin has built a five-year honey badger track record. Sure. All right. I, I don't want to argue on uh, the point, but I'll make a couple of uh, sure, please. rebuttals on this. Uh, the only thing is, uh, you've r recently read the uh, mail from uh, Gavin and Reese and, and as well as uh, Mike Hearn, both of them asking one very specific thing. Bitcoin doesn't need much developers, they need much testing. Every yes. single developer today who's spending time developing an altcoin because five get people around him, business related mostly, they're saying, hey, you know what, there's a pump and dump opportunity or whatever the case might be, whatever the incentives might be. Sometimes they're genuine as well. And it just leads that developer not devoting the time towards Bitcoin development or testing, right. and they are uh, spending not, the time. Yeah, I am not worried about that again, because you know, there are hundreds of startups in the Bitcoin space hiring thousands of people, many of whom are developers, many of whom, when building their applications, are testing Bitcoin in new environments and new scenarios. And we are going to see maybe 100,000 new developers join Bitcoin in 2014. Uh, this is a brand new space, and we have something that other spaces don't have, jobs paying jobs. Uh, I have one of those jobs. Um, so I'm, I'm not worried in the slightest. We're on an exponential growth path. We're going to have an abundance of developers. We haven't even seen the real emergence of uh, India, China, Russia, Brazil, etc., in terms of them adding to the developers pool. So let's let someone else take sure. the next question. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about jobs, actually, given that we're going to be able with Bitcoin to automate entire industries uh, mm -hmm. in a world population that continues to grow with a shrinking need for labor. Um, what are we going to do about the job situation? Well, I, I think we're actually going to be able to bring a lot more productive capacity online from, from all around the world. But 
you know, it's it's not about replacing jobs. It's about creating new ways of interacting in new types of economies. And and quite honestly, uh, the the big problem we have right now is that not that jobs don't exist or opportunities don't exist. It's that we have this giant black hole of war and derivatives and financialization that is sucking the productive wealth of this country and putting it into an environment where nothing is more profitable than war, nothing is more profitable than zero percent Fed loans, nothing is more profitable than algorithmic trading and making suckers of everybody's retirement. As long as that is the case, the entire economy will be stagnant, and Bitcoin gives us a new way of doing things. Hi, Andreas. Thank you for Hello. being here. Uh, my name is Rado, and I have a question for you. Yes. Um, as a person who really wants to have his children and grandchildren living in a world that's entirely voluntary, I would very much like to see Bitcoin play a major role in ending coercive relationships. I want to know what your opinion is about the end game. What will be the end game after Bitcoin has completely uh, disseminated itself throughout the world and people have a, an alternative that's fully voluntary to exchange value and to be able to transact without any third parties? I want to know what you think. Yeah, I mean, I really have no idea. I, I, I think one of the most important things you can do as a uh, as someone who tries to predict the future is to be humble in your predictions and try to aim for two years out at most. <laughs> <laughs> And that reduces the possibility of being wrong to only about 75 to 80 <laughs> percent. Um, so, you know, I I, th I see that Bitcoin is going to disrupt uh, many different industries, many different ways of doing business. It's going to change the financial environment. Uh, Irrevocably, forever, and in very dramatic and drastic ways, empowering individuals. You know, I see all of these things happening, but I don't know how they're going to unfold uh, any more than I know where the internet is going to be in two years, or that I could predict any of it three years ago. Uh, this is uh, this is riding one of the most wild rides in the world. Uh, it's it's you know the exponential dragon, and we're on its back, and so. I don't know, and that's great because neither do the people who are trying to uh, stop this. Um, what I do know is that regardless of where Bitcoin goes, the Bitcoin network can survive the Bitcoin currency, and the Bitcoin invention, the blockchain, can survive both. Cryptocurrencies are going to be part of our financial future for the next hundred years. That I can say with almost absolute certainty. It might not be Bitcoin, but cryptographic currencies will be part of our financial future. And once you realize that, um, you know, as I like to say, the bandwagon has started rolling. And there are two positions you can take towards the bandwagon. You can jump on board or you can get run over. I, I'm from West Texas, and um, I work in the oil and gas industry. And, My condolences. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the things that I've read recently is that 80% of the world's um, mineral rights are owned by governments, mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons why Texas has been so had such a good economy. It's because of the decentralization of the ownership of the minerals. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that I, I'm not a very techy person, but. I know that they say that Bitcoin has a lot of um, uses outside of currency. In your mind, do you see a use where um, property, uh, a title to oh, yeah. property, could be tied to a Bitcoin that could be um, that way? You don't need so much a government, but like you know, those third world countries where they're sitting all that dead capital. Right. Uh, could... Title and deed registry is probably one of the most exciting and one of the most immediate applications you can do with blockchain type technologies. One of my business partners, who is an attorney, is currently writing a number of papers on how you can use a combination of proof of existence, notarization, and attestation technologies uh, together with uh, proof of chain ownership through the blockchain in order to transfer not just the deed, uh, but also uh, easements and other aspects of property as they attach two deeds. Uh, and not only is it a matter of being a thousand times more efficient than trying to trawl through dusty books, it, cut down, it cuts right. down the risks of property transfer, which makes it uh, unnecessary to have massive amounts of title insurance and escrow fees uh, that cut into every uh, property transaction and over generations can erode the value of a property to zero. Uh, so yes, 
This provides transparency, accountability, uh, ease of use, and cryptographic certainty. The blockchain is, is going to be used for land registries for sure. Right, it's, it's a great application. Thank you. Um, I don't know how many uh, questions we can take. Who's, where's the moderator for this? Okay, someone scream to me when, we're, when we have to stop. Yeah. Uh, hi, Andreas. Uh, Michael Turpin with Bit Angels. First hi. of all, I just wanted to um, thank you on behalf of the entire community for uh, fighting the good fight uh, intelligently and in a rational manner, uh, while the other side, uh, you know, throws, uh, you know, uh, lawsuits and bombs. <laughs> well, you know, uh, we got to have a Mark Williams in every conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and to that to that effect, I wrote a piece uh, 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 this week that was uh, picked up on the CNN Money, calling for a state to sort of take the lead, either in the or maybe uh, Texas uh, to basically say instead of making new regulations, let's go and make a, a, a bit. Bitcoin uh, and crypto coin uh, sort of special uh, uh, SEZ like a special economic zone. Uh, it was heartening to see that Robocoin now has four devices that are that are opening up this week, and I guess we'll see if uh, everybody gets arrested next week. So, um, uh, what what are your thoughts in terms of um, can the states sort of be as much of a force to be able to like get that first little wedge, just like they've been for gay marriage and they've been for uh, marijuana? Well, I, I think so too, but it won't necessarily be the United States. Uh, keep in mind, Bitcoin is a transnational currency, and a lot of the innovation we're going to see is in the parts of the world where the need is greatest. And you're going to see that not just a move from states, but also a move from citizens of these states. So there's two distinctions I want to make. The first one is what do state regulators and national regulators do? There are plenty of countries in the world that have been doing arbitrage on tax law and investment law and free trade zones and things like that for decades or centuries. And a lot of these very small, very nimble nations where they can get laws passed quickly are moving quickly. Uh, Guernsey, Malta, Cyprus, uh, Singapore, uh, Switzerland, uh, Liechtenstein, uh, Barbados, Bermuda, a lot of those places are now moving very rapidly uh, to look at what positioning they can take vis-a-vis -vis cryptocurrencies and to make them, um, themselves they cryptocurrencies. They all FATCA. Sorry? After, after they all, every single one of them under pressure signed FATCA yes. to report to the U.S. Uh, all the bank right. accounts. Right, they have to report all of the fiat accounts, which will be less and less relevant over time. And so um, we will see also innovation within the states. Uh, and I think we're going to see uh, some of the states uh, peel away and try to be more friendly to cryptocurrencies. And keep in mind, no one is fighting Bitcoin. Uh, you know, there's this, uh, I think, a, a slight dose of paranoia, but for the most part, uh, um, most of the moneyed interests really don't understand this. They view us a bit like a lemon stand, a lemonade stand that's trying to take on Walmart. It's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's like, and I'm very happy with that. I hope they spend another three years thinking of us that way. Um, and. Um, you know, they're, they're, at, at the moment, I, I picture the regulators and state regulators and the big bankers sitting on a beach drinking their Mai Tais, wondering why the surf is receding. And uh, we know why the surf is receding. It's a tsunami uh, coming their way. Uh, and they have no idea. They're going to go out and gather pebbles from the beach. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to continue having this conversation. But it, at the end of the day, um, the, the real question that is going to face regulators is going to face state States, is going to face nation states, is going to face every single bank and exchange, is this. Do we fight this and get disrupted in 10 years? Or do we join this and get disrupted in five, but get a piece of that pie? And when you have that proposition, we saw exactly what happened in the internet. They fought valiantly for a while, and then one of the herd peels off, and then there's a stampede uh, to see who's going to jump on board. Uh, and now, every single telecommunications network in the world is running on top of IP instead of trying to ban it. Uh, I think very much the same is going to happen with cryptocurrency. First, they'll try to adapt, then they'll try to co-opt, then they'll adopt, then they'll run their entire operations on top of it eventually. And it's just a matter of who positions themselves to be the, uh, the next Amazon, the next Google, the next Yahoo, or the next Blockbuster, the next Tower Records, uh, and, and goes down with the ship. So um, I'm, I'm not too worried, but I think we're going to have a lot of variety. No one's trying to fight us yet. Uh, and most. Uh, bankers and regulators are smart enough to realize the tremendous opportunity for jobs and innovation and growth in this space and would rather take advantage of that than try to strangle it. The ones that don't will route around.
Um, Nima. <laughs> did you have any thoughts or predictions on mining centralization in SHA-256 versus script currencies? Well, I, I think it's really interesting because uh, mining centralization is, is seen as this uh, huge problem, but people don't often talk about the opposite problem. Uh, which is that if you create a currency that can be mined uh, by small-scale CPUs, then the most efficient way to mine on that currency is to take over all the world's computers and make a giant botnet. Uh, so botnet mining becomes a huge problem when you don't have dedicated hardware or where it doesn't take fairly sophisticated and high-end hardware. So Centralization versus decentralization of mining is a matter of balance. And I think we already see a range of solutions uh, in the market that allow us to test out these scenarios. And quite honestly, the way these coins are fungible, if one of these scenarios starts going bad, uh, then we can switch to, to other currencies quite easily. Keep in mind also that miners are increasingly not the only mechanism for consensus within Bitcoin. They used to be the predominant mechanism for consensus. Right now, if the miners decide to fork and go in one direction, and blockchain, Coinbase, Bitstamp, and BitPay stay behind, and every single one of the users say, screw that, we're not coming with you, then they're mining blocks without transactions in them. And which blockchain is the real one then? The one where we're spending our money is the real one. So there are already five constituencies within the consensus mechanism. There's miners, there's merchants, there's web wallets, there's exchanges and banks, and finally there's the end users and the wallets they choose to use. And consensus now depends on all five parties achieving consensus. So rather than having consensus hijacked, I think very soon, probably within two years, we're going to face the exact opposite problem, which is that at least in Bitcoin, where this will be very strong and high-level requirement consensus, you know, peta hashes, yota hashes, whatever, uh, and millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of users' wallets, etc. It will be almost impossible to achieve global consensus for any hard fork, let alone one that that offends the interests of one of those parties. Uh, I'm not worried about centralization. Uh, miners will be able to use centralization to gain the mining reward. They will no longer be able to use it to game the system. Thank you. Just, uh, just a quick follow-up on that. Um, do you have any concerns about a large nation state that has um, interest in just actively destroying Bitcoin to make their own you know, super rigs and uh, design chips and just throw hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to intentionally disrupt the blockchain? Yeah, I, I don't worry about that at all. Um, this cannot be done with Bitcoin anymore. This is something that can only be done with nascent altcoins. Uh, Bitcoin has achieved a, a level of computing that uh, no single nation state can, uh, can overthrow it through computation alone. Uh, the effort to do so would require a massive covert operation of chip fabrication, uh, then the coordinated assault that would give them dominance over the next block for 10 minutes until we kick those bastards off the network, uh, rework the protocol around them. They would be revealed. They would have lost a billion dollars doing this, and all they got to do was one double spend. <laughs> Now, here's the thing. Long before we get to that point, they figure out that if they just let this stuff run, they can actually get some Bitcoin <laughs> as a reward, because the incentive structure actually works. And so I'm not worried about that. Um, this is the kind of heavy-handed action that can, that can drive conspiracy theory, but is really only applicable on a small scale for a small altcoin. Governments aren't good at doing massive conspiracy. They're good at doing small conspiracy, but massive conspiracy like that doesn't go unnoticed. And, and a lot of people are watching the blockchain. And as I said before, what are they going to do? So they take over and they fork the blockchain and they go somewhere. Right? They've created an alternative blockchain. Great. What are we going to do? Who's going to join the NSA blockchain? <laughs> Anybody want to jump on Fedcoin? <laughs> so we're all going to stay on the old fork. Difficulty will go down. It will get more profitable for the miners who stayed behind. And we'll carry on with our coin, and they can go mine whatever the hell they want on their alternative blockchain. They achieve nothing. They can't make protocol changes because, we, as I said, five constituencies in consensus, and it would take a billion dollars to pull the most ridiculous Keystone Cops failure in history. <laughs> Plus, this would actually require government that can do IT. <laughs> Thank you.
You think they can organize a massive mining rig? Uh, <laughs> uh, go check out uh, healthcare.gov. <laughs> All right, uh, let me take another question here. Well, just, just one quick yeah. follow up. Um, it would require changes to the protocol, as you, as you mentioned, SWIFT changes in the event of a double spend by a nation like that. Are you concerned with the lack of investment in the core dev team right now? No, not at all, because uh, there is no core dev team. This is a big misunderstanding is that people say, who are the core devs? Uh, the core devs are the people who are developers and write stuff for core. If you are a developer and you write stuff that goes into the core Bitcoin D, you are a core dev. There is no ceremony where Gavin Andreessen comes out, pulls out his sword, and says, by the power invested in me by Satoshi Nakamoto, I name the core dev. That's not how it works. This is an open source project. Anyone can contribute code. And if the need arises and we need a really rapid patch, I'm going to be writing code. Who else in this room is going to be writing code for Bitcoin D to save Bitcoin D from the banks? There you go. We're all core devs. No worries. <laughs> Thank you, Andreas. I'm Morpheus, and my question is: is with a tinkering with with the with Bitcoin as we go further and further in, into the future, it's possible to do things that are are going like our government. We start off with a pretty good idea, and now we're heading into the police state over the course of time, making these little tweaks that that create problems that make make it um, people not want to use the use Bitcoin. Is how do you see that these tweaks could be used against it, so to speak? Yeah, I, I don't see that as a problem. I mean, um, really, this is a system that removes the central levers of power. It decentralizes power and diffuses it in the hands of so many people that actually modifying the system to take control becomes increasingly difficult. That's the magic of the decentralized blockchain, is the consensus is spread among so many different players. Essentially on the blockchain, we have an election every 10 minutes. And if we decide to vote differently, vote with our wallets, vote with our web wallets, vote with our exchanges, and vote with our mining gear, uh, we change the election. And we have that election every 10 minutes. That is a system that is designed to be compromise proof. And, and, <laughs> and, so, um, and so it becomes increasingly difficult to violate the integrity of that system. The bigger Bitcoin gets, the more people adopt it. You know, I don't see adoption slowing down. I see adoption accelerating. Even in the face of the worst news we've had over the last two months, the end result has been that for the last two weeks, Bitcoin has been in the headlines of every national newspaper in every country in the world. And what they've been telling everyone is that Bitcoin is dead. And all of those people will hear about Bitcoin three or four times in the last two months, and then a month from now, they're going to check, perhaps they're going to check the website isbitcoindead.com. Uh, it's a real website. It, it's a static HTML page that says no. <laughs> they're going to check that site, and they're going to say, hey, this thing must have been a hell of a lot more resilient than we thought. I guess the media was lying to us again. Maybe I should buy some Bitcoin. We're now getting the mainstream marketing because people are talking about Bitcoin. And why are they talking about Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin is now important enough for the national media in every single country to cover. And it doesn't matter if it's bad news. It's news. As they say, I don't care what the hell you print about me. Just spell my name right. B-I-T-C-O-I-N. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we've heard a bunch of great questions asking, is this a problem, is this a problem, is this a problem? I'm going to ask, what, what do you think the biggest threat to the uh, blockchain ecosystem is? Uh, I don't think there are any external threats uh, to Bitcoin. I, I think most of the threats are internal. The things that can happen from the outside can only slow us down temporarily and then cause a bounce back of the price. In fact, what they do is they train the network. Uh, Bitcoin exhibits anti-fragile characteristics, which means that it operates as a giant distributed immune system. Every time you expose it to a new type of attack, it learns, it adapts, it becomes robust, and it repels that attack. And next time, that attack is ineffective. Um, four or five weeks ago, we had the first uh, distributed uh, denial of service using transaction malleability. Right? And exchanges had to temporarily suspend withdrawals. Guess what? That distributed denial of service attack continues today. 
No one is affected anymore because the network is now immune to that type of attack because it became more robust. Uh, over time, as Bitcoin gets attacked, it becomes more and more robust. I think. The only thing you can do is delay Bitcoin, and we can have uh, fundamental problems within Bitcoin within the code base. I think these are extremely unlikely. Um, if they do happen, we can fix them. If we can't fix them, that's even more unlikely. Uh, then we're going to have a problem with the currency, and then we're going to have to pick another alt currency. But the cryptocurrency concept itself cannot be stopped because right now as i mentioned earlier any 5 year old can create a new one and that means that developers are going to create interesting new ones uh, i actually think bitcoin uh, is not going anywhere i think it just keeps getting stronger and stronger over time and then becomes the reserve currency for all of the other altcoins uh, and eventually provides reserve status by feeding value into other currencies so you know i i cannot see a scenario under which it goes down and i'll, I'll give you a similar example. Uh, tell me how someone can take down the internet. I cannot see a scenario by which you can end the internet. And so, since I cannot see a scenario, and I'm not talking about a global EMP because at that point we're all growing parsnips, uh, but <laughs> that doesn't take down the internet. That takes down human civilization. Two different things. Uh, we have bigger problems then. But you cannot take down the internet now anymore. It's simply not possible. You cannot take it down. You can take parts of it down, uh, you can stop it for a while, and then you have to reboot it. But you cannot end the internet forever. That cannot happen. I feel exactly the same way about Bitcoin. And if you understand why you can't take down the internet, that's why you can't take down Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin is the internet. It's the internet of money. Um, yeah, I think I need to uh, end my uh, talk. I don't know how much time we have for this. Yeah. Yeah. There are other sessions. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time.